is like that. Um, uh, well, well, welcome everyone to the FTGS Global Voices Seminar Series. This series of events uh, with incredible scholars is designed to showcase and amplify the expertise and research of members of the Feminist Theory and Gender Studies section of the ISA in partnership with King's College London. Um, our events are recorded, uh, recorded and they're going to be available on YouTube later on, so make sure to follow our social media to get the, the links. Um, this series is hosted by Dr. Amanda Shitholm here present a senior lecturer in security studies and researcher in gender and security at King's College London, and also co-hosted by me, Lua Tomas. Uh, I'm cur currently a PhD student researching feminist movements in South America in a historical perspective. Um, the Global Voices seminars aim to promote a global conversation on issues pertaining to feminism, gender and international relations. And for today, we are pleased to welcome as our speaker, Dr. Julia Zover, Currently, a Marie Sklodowska Curie Research Fellow at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies, and also at the Instituto de Investigaciones Jurídicas at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México in Mexico. Her, works in, her work investigates women's high-risk leadership in Latin America with a focus on Mexico, El Salvador, and Colombia. Uh, she has extensive research and also practical experience along the Colombia-Venezuela border where she supports Lady Smith Costas de Mujeres Gender Data Project with vulnerable, vulnerable women. She earned a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Oxford and has recently launched her book called High Risk Feminism in Colombia, just last month, so congratulations. Um, to discuss Dr. Zover's research, we have Dr. Yauk uh, Bonstein, sorry to mispronounce it, a professor in gender and development in King, at King's College London as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that you can also write questions in the chat for our Q&A section later on. Uh, so Dr. Zover, the floor is yours. Hi there, good morning. And um, as Lua said, we've had some technical issues. I'm gonna have my camera on just for a minute, but I actually am on field work right now, um, doing some follow-up work to the research from this book, which perhaps is part of my new fellowship, which I might explain at the end. And, um, you know, for all that I came to the small town and looked for the place with the best internet and it was working last night, it was kind of a shrug and a hands up and it's, well, it's not working this morning. So I'm connecting via my phone and Amanda has graciously said that she will flip through the slides. So I'm going to turn my video off, but I am here. Um, thank you so much to all for the invitation this morning. I'm really excited to be able to present my book to you and to hear Yelke's comments, Yelke actually I was mentioning before we got going was, I wrote one of the endorsements for my book many months ago. So I, I really appreciate um, her being here and I, I'm looking forward to, to hearing your comments. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm just gonna get started. So this book, uh, High Risk Feminism in Colombia, Women's Mobilization in Violent Context uh, was the product of um, PhD research I did and then some postdoc research I did. Um, and then came together in book form during the pandemic when I was um, like everyone trapped at home. But being here in Colombia today and, and um, this morning and kind of some of the conversations I've been having really has put it back into really vibrant perspective for me. So Amanda, if you don't mind going to the next slide. I'm gonna begin by, by reading um, one of the, the stories that begins the book. Um, and when the site comes up, yeah, that's the picture. So this is kind of the picture that gives the context to where I was, but this is, this is a story of, um, of one of the women who I met in the north of Colombia in 20, late 2016, I think. So the book begins by, by talking about Angela's story and it says, Angela and I were sitting on a bus traveling from Turbaco to Barranquilla when she decided to share her story with me. We'd met a few months earlier when I first arrived in Colombia and although we'd spent lots of time together, she'd never chosen to, up, to open up to me about her past. Originally from Magdalena, she and her husband were displaced from the countryside to an urban center after her family members were murdered by paramilitaries. It was in that city that her husband was killed and she had to move to El Pozón, a slum near Cartagena with her children. This was where she joined the Liga de Mujeres Desplazadas, the League of Displaced Women and moved that later to the city of women. 
Her second husband was murdered on the doorstep of her house when their youngest child was only six months old. She told me about the early days of the city when the women continued to be threatened by armed groups. Her words were clear. Despite so much pain, so many violations, so much damage, the voice of us women has always survived. We'd woken up early and we were en route to a rally where women from all over the Caribbean coast would come together to express their support for the peace accords negotiated between the Colombian government and the FARC. It was a moment of expectation. You can see in this picture, full of hopeful symbols, women wearing white, images of doves of peace, t-shirts with brightly colored messages of C, referring to the yes vote for the national re referendum. And Angela told me that she'd been reflecting on the, what the day meant to her. She said, behind every smile, there is a story. Next slide, please, Amanda. And then years later, at the opposite end of the country, Sandra and I were sitting in the office of a local government employee in southern Putumayo, near to the border with Ecuador. The desk then created a background of white noise that at times made it hard to hear her, particularly when her voice lowered as she spoke about memories of the past. I asked if she could tell me a little bit about how she had come to join the Alianza de Mujeres Tejedores de Vida del Putumayo, the Women's Alliance of Putumayo. She developed, delved into a story that involved kidnap and sexual abuse as a young woman. It was this experience that eventually led her to join the Alianza, where she was finally able to talk to other women about her experiences and find solidarity in group membership. For her, the traumas of the past were an intrinsic part of the reason why she joined the Alianza. Being part of this organization is dangerous for Sandra today. She told me that only a few months before, when this conversation was in 2018, Armed men had entered her house and told her that unless she stopped her community work and joined them, they would kill both her and her daughters. While our conversation focused on resistance and resilience, it was clear that times were tense. As soon as we left the building, we were accompanied by her government issued bodyguard who followed us a few paces behind as we walked to a small restaurant located on the edge of the town plaza. The next time I met up with Sandra in late 2019, she was no longer living in the South had become too much and she had been forced to displace herself to the departmental capital of Mokwa. Next slide, please. So for those of you here today who don't know um, much about the Colombian context, and I'm sure that if you've seen the title of the book, you probably do have some understanding. Um, all of these stories and stories that I'm going to be referring to today and the stories that build up uh, the, the, main, the main content of the book come from Colombia and come out of this context of a civil war uh, that was drawing to a close when I began my research and then continued to, to change and transform and re reconfigure as the research was ongoing. Um, Colombian conflict in, has many iterations, has many different actors, um, but in 2016, a peace process was eventually signed between the FARC, who was at that time the biggest guerrilla group, and the government of Colombia. And that brought an end to five decades of war between these two factions. However, we know that during the conflict, gender violence was rife. And uh, of the, the almost 9 million victims who were registered by the country's transitional justice mechanism, uh, over half of them, just over half of them were women. And we also know that sexual violence was a constant it actually wasn't a constant. It was very frequent in many parts of the country during the armed conflict. And we know that 34,000 cases of, of this violence have been registered, although because of difficulties around reporting, around fear, around shame, that, that's clearly a lowball number. Um, but what it tells us is that sexual violence and other kinds of gendered violences in the context of this conflict were used widely for social and territorial control by armed groups, the various armed groups who were at play. And yet, as I just hinted to, even after the peace accord was signed, the areas where the FARC had had dominance were left empty. And so other groups and different forms and reconfigurations of new groups began to fill these power vacuums, uh, vying, for, vying for this control and using violence again. So since the peace process was, the, the peace accords were signed in 2016, we've seen this real uptick in violence, which looks like mass displacements, more massacres, um, sexual violence is in some places returning, the, the killing of social leaders, um, and particularly right now, which is why I'm here, which is between this, uh, this, the two rounds of the, the national election, violence um, against communities and against social leaders in particular is, is at a high that we haven't seen since 
some of the darkest days of the conflict. And we also know, as this next slide says, that that gender, uh, sorry, that conflict is gendered. And I've cited Cynthia Coburn here, but um, Professor Bolke, um, Boston's work, sorry, is, is very much about this too. Kind of the idea that not only as Cynthia Coburn says that, that uh, conflict is gender in terms of the kinds of violence. So she says that men and women die different deaths and are abused in different ways in wars because of the physical differences between the sexes and because of the different meanings that are ascribed to male and female bodies. But she also talks, uh, as, as Yoki does, about um, conflict as gendered in terms of time, in terms of what it means to have a pre-conflict moment, a conflict moment, a post-conflict moment. And they talk about this on a continuum of violence or a continuum of conflict. Uh, so for example, Cynthia Coburn talks about her experiences um, and her research saying that sometimes this nominally post-war period is better called interbellum or a pause before fighting begins again. And Professor Boson's work uh, talks in the case of Peru, for example, about how violence continued through this heightened conflict moment into a post-conflict moment and what that tells us about the, the violence itself uh, as it extends beyond this kind of circumscribed or, or bounded period in time, which we can say perhaps you know, bad things happen in conflict. This is how we can explain it. How do we explain and understand these gendered forms of conflict when perhaps the, the peace accords have already been signed or the violence in theory is, is no longer supposed to be acted in raging parties? The next, uh, next slide, please. So in the context of, of thinking about conflict as gendered and thinking about the Colombian conflict as gendered, um, I started to ask myself as I was doing my PhD, you know, why is it that in these moments of, of high violence, it was during the conflict, technically, as I began, um, why is it that we, you know, that, that we're seeing that women are going out and mobilizing? Because in the face of these high risks of violence during both conflict and then afterwards, as I continued my research, for which was normally a post-conflict moment, we might assume that women turn inside to programs uh, like the house to take care of themselves, to protect themselves. And that a function, as a function of fear of violence, uh, as a function of the dictated norms around what women's roles are supposed to be, as a fear of social isolation, we think, I, I thought at least, and, and some of the literature would point to, and social movement studies literature would point to, the fact that women or, or you know, citizens wouldn't mobilize when doing so put such a great risk on their head. But this isn't always the case in Colombia, which I'm sure the title of this book kind of gave away. Um, the next slide, please. Because in Colombia, as in, in other countries, as I've, I've learned, what we actually see is that sometimes women do go out and mobilize, putting themselves directly in harm's way. And so the question that this book aims to, to tackle and investigate and, and answer to a degree is why, when the response to acting collectively uh, can be threats, stalking, violence, murder, um, displacement, threats to children, do women decide to assume this risk anyway? Uh, next slide, please. And so the question that, uh, the thing that kind of became immediately clear when I was, when I began this research in different parts of Colombia, which I'm gonna talk about at uh, the case studies in a minute, is that it is a case that when these women are mobilized, they do expose themselves to higher risk for violence and for retribution. So in contesting the violent dynamics and going out and mobilizing and joining community groups and joining organizations and making demands on the state and on the armed groups and on the communities in which they live, the women are exposing themselves to various forms of violence and threats. And I have here that the threats are twofold, but in, uh, I actually think that it's threefold and I should update the slide. Um, firstly, the women are daring to disturb imposed social order by mobilizing against armed groups in the first place. So basically in these towns and territories where armed groups come in and impose control over the land and impose control over the communities, um, anyone who dares to work towards social cohesion or who dares to make demands or, or go back or push back against that control um, puts them itself at risk of violence. The second layer or the second kind of you know, pillar of violence to which they expose themselves is the fact that they are women who are doing this 
this uh, making these demands who are engaging in this mobilization and that they're they're going against and they're transgressing the socially acceptable gender norms that are imposed by the communities themselves often and also these armed groups who operate under logics of really heightened and militarized masculinities where there are very specific roles for men and women and women's roles are not to be out in the streets or not to be out in um, kind of the public space making demands and pushing it back against these sources of violence. And then the third layer, I would say, which I had put into the second bullet, but I do think that it's a separate one, is that not only are, is anyone um, pushing back against this imposed order, not only are women doing it and transgressing, transgressing or challenging gender norms, but also they're making demands for women's rights and gender justice, which is sort of the icing on the cake when it comes to, to really um, pushing back and, and engaging and transgressive behavior in these contexts which are controlled by uh, different kinds of armed groups during during Colombia's armed conflict in its aftermath. Next slide, please. And so the question becomes, um, in, in this question of what I call the, the high-risk high feminism, high-risk feminism for me is this ability and this way to understand the why and the how of women, of, of why and how women are willing to take on mobilization and collective action and engage in these behaviors when the risks are so high. And so in order to understand the why and the how, we have to put a gender lens on high risk collective action. And one of the things that immediately became clear in the case studies I was working in is that leadership is critical uh, when it comes to convincing a specific population, in this case, women, many of whom actually, in fact, all of the victims of different kinds of conflict related gendered violence, um, when it came to convincing them to mobilize, that it was worth their while, that doing something that at face value seemed very risky actually was going to be valuable for them. And so what I saw is that charismatic leaders, specific kinds of charismatic leaders can come into these communities and frame the comparative benefits of mobilization to those who are operating in a domain of losses. Um, here I borrow from behavioral economics and I look at the prospect theory, which I'm not gonna get into in detail today, but effectively what these leaders are able to do is they're able to say to the women who they, they start to gather and they start to organize, you know, think about it this way, being a person in your town, just being a woman in your town is dangerous in and of itself. So even if you don't mobilize, even if you don't engage in this action, non-action doesn't guarantee your safety. And you can see that because all of these women before they had even mobilized, before they joined the groups, had suffered different kinds of violence it's simply for being women and gendered citizens in these towns and territories and villages where they live. And so the leaders can then say, absolutely, joining a group is going to bring with it more risk. Picking your neck out, making demands is going to shine a light on you and on our organization for further targeting and for retributional targeting. But that being said, when you compare the differences, when you compare that differential between just being a citizen and the risks of just being a citizen in a territory controlled by these violent actors and then mobilizing, which absolutely does increase your risk profile, the difference, that differential is actually smaller than perhaps you would have thought at face value. Non-action doesn't guarantee safety and therefore the risk, the risk differential or the, the comparative risk of mobilizing versus not mobilizing is much smaller. And then what they say is, and that comparative difference, that differential in the risk assessment can be offset by the potential benefits of membership and participation in these groups, which only comes to those who do participate. And these benefits are both material and non-material. So beginning with the non-material, they can look like building a collective identity, making women feel that they are part of a group, letting women know that what they suffered in terms of the various violences they've suffered wasn't something individual, it was something that was strategic and collective and that they didn't take on or they didn't experience because of something personal belonging to them or something personal that they did. And so what we see there is that women can then come together, they can begin to talk about their experiences, they can begin to, uh, to share and exchange what they suffered. And in doing so, that creates these non-material benefits of healing of membership, of identity that are incredibly value, valuable in these, these contexts of ongoing and, and chronic violence and chronic conflict. And then the material benefits that one can gain from joining one of these high-risk feminist organizations 
are related to um, well, obviously material benefits. So being able to come together as a collective and apply for projects and get money and resources. Um, for example, in the case of the Liga, to build a city, to build their own houses. Or um, in the case of Abra Mupas, who I'll also talk about, to apply as collective, um, to apply for collective reparations in the country's transitional justice uh, program, which means that not only can women get their individual payouts for the violence that they suffered, but also that as a group, they can apply for things that will support them as a group. And that allows them to uh, build economic projects, productive projects, the ability to generate incomes, the ability to create safe spaces, the ability to have uh, additional healing programs, for example. And all of this is contingent on joining a group. So this charismatic leader forms what's called a charismatic bond with the particular women in her community and can, can convince them by doing the strategic framing of saying um, the risks need to be assessed comparatively and in comparison or in relation to the potential benefits that we see women saying, yeah, I understand that it's more dangerous for me to live in this town and participate in a women's organization, but the benefits make it justifiable or make it worthwhile. Uh, next slide, please. And so I also won't get into the exact how strategies because I've, I've gone through many of them, but what the, what the charismatic leader does and, and really gets the members on board and so the members uh, originally are bonding with a charismatic leader, but then over time they're bonding with each other. Um, they operate in these conditions of violence and they strategically engage with the four pillars of action, which are building collective identity, um, which is creating um, social capital, laying out social capital, both bonding and bridging. Um, so bonding within the group, bridging with other um, organizations. So for example, funders or international organizations who can provide resources. Um, the third pillar looks at strategic framing. So saying and finding ways to frame and use the language, the legal language of the state in its very developed laws and outdoors and constitutional court uh, hearings and, and documents and to frame the experiences that they have suffered in terms of this legal language, creating a, a shared way of talking about these experiences that then highlight the responsibilities that the government or other organizations or institutions do owe to these women as victims of the armed conflict. And then finally, the final pillar is certification, which is engaging in public expressions of legitimacy. So going out and marching or protesting or taking over um, various government offices or even holding um, kind of cultural fairs or cultural activities which say and promote outwardly to outward actors that these organizations are legitimate, they have legitimate demands and that they need to be taken seriously. So the women come together and they contest their violent surroundings actively, demanding a more gender just society. They turn their fear into anger and resistance, which shifts this perspective on risk taking under the gui guidance of a charismatic leader. Uh, next slide, please. So that's sort of the, the theoretical chapter of the book and it explains the why and the how of, of women's uh, willingness to engage in this high-risk feminism or this high-risk collective action that's pushing and, and demanding gender justice. And what I did in, the, in my field work is I engaged with four different communities to understand how this took shape on the ground. Um, and as, as you will have heard in the beginning, uh, I used the stories and the voices and I really took them seriously and included them in the book to, to bring and highlight that these grassroots women's organizations who aren't always featured in, um, who aren't always featured when it comes to the, the high level conversations or the high level peace negotiations. Um, I wanted to, to take insights and to learn from them and their experiences. So the first case is in Turbaco Bolivar. And it's, um, this is Angela's case. So this is the, the Liga de Mujeres Desplazadas. This was an organization of women. Um, it was a group of women actually who were completely displaced from all over the Caribbean coast here in Colombia. And they arrived in Cartagena, in the slums of Cartagena, um, often newly widowed, usually with multiple children, just completely displaced from these towns that they were living in, which were suffering extreme violence and massacres. And in arriving to El Poisson, this, this slum in Cartagena, they um, continued to suffer ongoing violences because these areas were gang controlled. But initially, some of the women started to come together really informally to make a soup so that they could feed their children. So one woman would bring 
the potato, the other woman brings a piece of meat, the other woman brings the carrot, and they, they put the food together so that they could start feeding their children collectively. And then they started, you know, as they were together meeting these very practical needs, they started to chat more about uh, their experiences. And, and at this point, a woman called Patricia Guerrero arrived, and she was a lawyer, and she had a lot of experience in the women's movement, and she met this really informal group of women and started to talk to them about things they'd never heard before. So about women's rights and about victims' rights and about the fact that the experiences they'd suffered in the conflict weren't because of them individually or anything they'd done, but these were part of a large strategy that armed groups use um, to control women's bodies and to control um, women's lives as a, one of the strategies of social control in these territories. And so as they began to grow and learn about these strategic interests that they had, they started to, to organize, to have meetings, to think about how they could frame their demands. And the way that this culminated was in the early 2000s, they decided that what they really wanted was to have their homes back. They'd been kicked out of their homes, they'd been displaced from their farms and their towns, and they wanted their homes. They wanted the titles and the deeds to their homes. So their big project was to come together to build what they call their sueño de una vida digna, their dream of a dignified life. And Patricia Guerrero was able to, through her connections, get uh, resources from a US senator, um, you know, financial resources, and they were able to come together and build the city of women in Turbaco and Bolivar. They were able to put the money together and find out how to make bricks and how to level out the ground and how to put together this little neighborhood um, with around a hundred houses that belonged to the women and could give them a home when that had been taken away from them. And that for them um, was part of their vision of what a more gender just society would look like. However, even in building this city and in living there today, they continue to face ongoing violences. Um, at the time when they were building it, this area was heavily controlled by different paramilitary groups who didn't want uh, organizations of women coming in and making demands and organizing and creating community and social cohesion. So during the process of building the city, um, there were ongoing murders, there were ongoing threats, there was ongoing stalking and harassment of these women. And even today, I, I haven't spoken to them in a little while and today, um, this part of the country very much is experiencing ongoing harassment, um, stalking, murders of social leaders, threats and violence. And again, particularly against those people who are most visible, who in this case and in this neighborhood happen to be the Liga de Mujeres Desplazadas, who not only have mobilized in a territory where uh, the paramilitary groups didn't want mobilization, but also are women and are doing that um, engaging in that, that transgression of what women's roles are supposed to be according to those, those arms groups. Uh, next slide, please. So the next, uh, our, the next group of women I worked with were in Bogota. It was called Afro Mubas, and it was an organization of women who, um, live in, who live in Usme in the very south of Bogota, but they have all been displaced from the Pacific coast which was another territory which featured and, and continues to feature the presence of multiple armed groups who are vying and clashing for control um, with civilians being at the kind of in the, in the crossfire. So these women uh, were displaced from the Pacific coast. They started arriving in, in Bogota, some of them via other areas that they, they arrived and they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. They were new in a big cold city. And uh, racism absolutely was another factor and another layer in the question of afro Mupas because these are all Afro-Colombian women. Uh, and so not only are they women, but also they're black women. And so the different vulnerabilities they experienced both because of gender, because of location, their rural location and because of race were all interlocking and intersecting. Um, and in this context, there was a woman, Maria Eugenia Urrutia, who had organizational experience back at home. And she started to notice that women, these Afro women had really specific needs, but they were very isolated and they were operating as little atoms. And so she wanted to bring them together in an organization that eventually uh, she formed, Afro Mubas. And the women started to engage in these healing processes. They, they drew on traditional and ancestral wisdoms and knowledges to build a 14 step healing process so that they could overcome the violences they'd suffered in their home territories. They also applied for collective reparations eventually to the Transitional Justice Institute. They also were coming together to build a safe space. They had 
a, um, uh, like a meeting house where there was an industrial kitchen where the women could cook and make um, different beauty products and could sew and could sell these products so that they could earn some level of a wage, which wasn't something that they were able to do by themselves. And so they came together making these demands about what they wanted in terms of reparations, but also what they wanted in terms of redignifying themselves um, in the context of having suffered this, these violences and, and making demands not only on the state, but on also on in different international organizations, on the community to take them seriously and to help them um, build these safe spaces for themselves. But again, this was not a safe space to be operating in. And actually in 2010, um, Maria Eugenia and her assistant were kidnapped from the house, were taken outside the city, were horrifically abused as a way um, to, to punish them and to make an example of them so that the other women of Abdel Mupas wouldn't continue and would be um, kind of scared into not engaging in this collective action anymore because it was upsetting the ability of the different paramilitary groups operating in the area to recruit children, to sell drugs, to engage in trafficking. Um, to continue their, their grip on this community as, um, as the controllers. And so Maria Eugenia and her, her assistant continued uh, after this horrible um, experience, they decided to continue to mobilize, to continue to engage in this collective action, making demands for gender justice. Um, and uh, today, actually, since I, I worked with them, they've moved now into a new space that they got, which is their own home and their own um, headquarters. And they're continuing to support other women who, um, have suffered or who did suffer violence during the armed conflict. They're only now coming to terms with that and wanting to heal. Uh, next slide. I'm going to really quickly, very quickly talk about this slide because I'm looking at the time and I know we started a little bit late. And I'm really excited to hear Yelke's comments. Um, but the next slide is a community of women who didn't mobilize in the same way. It's in a place called La Soledad, which is not actually its real name. Um, it's, I was asked not to use the real name in a province called uh, La Guajira, which is on the border with Venezuela in the very north of the country. Um, and I was looking for a community of really similar women demographically. So women who ethnically and racially and socioeconomically and religiously and educational levelly uh, were really similar and yet who didn't mobilize. And in the research design process, finding this negative case which doesn't, you know, kind of have normative value or normative judgment. It's just negative in terms of not seeing the same phenomenon happen. Can also tell us about when when high risk feminism does happen. And so this is a case where there was a group of women. There was a nominally a leader, but they weren't really getting engaging in any kind of high risk collective action. They would meet, they would sit, they would chat, they would talk. They very much were a support group for each other. But when it came to actually um, you know, strategically thinking about framing their resist, framing their action in terms of resistance and anger and in terms of fear, this is not something that the local leader was able to do. She also didn't have the ability to um, engage in any kind of bridging social capital creation. There were never any resources, there were never any projects. And so while this group was a, a you know, a supportive group and a nice group, they weren't really engaging in this high risk feminism because there was still a feeling of fear and, and there was no charismatic leader. There was a lovely leader, but she wasn't charismatic in terms of that ability to really frame how women can justify increasing their exposure to risk through the potential for material and non-material benefits. Next slide, please. And so the very final um, case I did, and this was after the PhD had ended and I was doing some other uh, postdoctoral work, um, really highlights this question of, of the temporality of the the continuum of violence as it exists over time. So this organization I was working with, this is Sandra's story, the Alianza um, is an organization in the south of the country in a place that was hit incredibly hard by paramilitary extreme violence, um, particularly in the late 90s and early 2000s. And this group, the Alianza came together, they began to work on women's empowerment, on making demands, on um, denouncing crimes of gendered violence through the different mechanisms they had available to them. And then as uh, the peace process came into play, the, the situation in their context in their community became a lot safer. And they were really encouraged, in fact, by various actors who were pushing the women's peace and security agenda to go out and build peace in their community, to be you know, weavers of life, to regenerate social cohesion. 
But shortly after the peace process was signed, as I mentioned earlier, violence began to return and violent actors began to return to these territories looking for new social control after the FARC had left. And so in this part of the country, in Putumayo in particular, the women who had really been very strong, very active and very visible community leaders began to be targeted, not only again, to, to highlight again, not only because they were out there as community leaders, but also because they were women and they were being punished publicly and violently for engaging in this community work. I have actually a separate article which looks at, at what I call patriarchal backlash in these post-conflict moments or nominally post-conflict moments. Um, and I really engage with what it means to have gone through uh, conflict uh, context mobilization, really you know, leaning in and investing Thing in what's a post-conflict moment and, and that reconstruction, that post-conflict reconstruction, and then what it means to be targeted for doing so. Um, we can go to the next slide. And so what um, all of this is a kind of shape in the book, which is now available, which I'm, I'm really excited to, to hear uh, Yelke's thoughts, but also if, if others are interested, um, I do have a discount code, so let me know if, you, if that would be useful for you and I can share that. Um, but all in all, this book, what it does is it, it asks questions about uh, this continuum of violence. So it asks questions around when is war actually over for women? It also challenges our assumptions that women, perhaps because they're seen as weaker or they're seen as having fewer resources or they're seen as being more vulnerable, are just passive victims in these contexts of conflict. Because we can see that they actually do go out and make challenges and make demands on society, particularly for gender justice. And so the book comes together to understand um, how they formulate, formula, how they think about, how they justify, how they organize this high risk feminism in these ongoing contexts of violence. And right now uh, here in Colombia, we're, we're right in the middle of, of the election season and Francia Marquez, who is herself a social leader, actually from the area that I'm in right now. Um, and she has come and gone into party politics and she is, now the vice presidential candidate for a party which has a very good chance of winning the elections. And she you know, has engaged in this high-risk feminism for years and years and years. Um, and she lately has been repeating this quote, which isn't actually her, another indigenous leader who was killed a few years ago. But what she says and what uh, Cristina Bautista, this other indigenous leader had said, really sums up what the heart of this book is, which is they say, if we're silent, they'll kill us. If we speak out, they'll kill us. So we may as well speak out. And for me, that is the heart and the soul of high-risk feminism. And I think there's one more slide, which is the uh, kind of exciting news, which is that the book is also, um, or has also been translated into Spanish and is gonna be coming out. Uh, now that we're in June, I'm not sure that it's actually going to be August, but it will be coming out soon, uh, later this summer. And I'm really excited to, um, to present it, not only here in Colombia, but also to, uh, others who are more comfortable reading in Spanish. So thank you so much again for, for coming today. Thank you for bearing with me as I'm not showing my video. Thank you to Amanda for doing the slides and and I really look forward at uh, okay, to your comments. Thank you so much, Julia. That was wonderful. And um, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody can hear me. Otherwise you will tell me if, if it's not clear. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I can't see you. No, that's correct. Your video is not on, or am I doing something? No, my wrong? video, my video, no, it's not on. It's because okay, of the, the phone oh. internet outage, but I am okay. here. No problem. Okay. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation, and more than anything for for the book itself. And it's wonderful to see um, uh, the cover on the slide and the cover of the Spanish version as well, which is wonderful. It's great that you can publish more or less parallel the Spanish version to the English version, which is really important uh, for the, uh, the, the conversation and to, to have that conversation with uh, a Colombian audience, obviously, and within Colombian uh, feminism as well. So I look forward to hear about that conversation uh, at some future date as well. You know how um, the, the feminists in suits, as, as, as some of your participants call them, 
uh, response to, to this book. Uh, and I really look forward to hear about that as well. I think one of the things that your book does so well and what, what I find really important is, is this question of how and when do women turn fear into resistance? No, um, I'm very interested in, and have always been interested in this idea of how do you d d uh, turn trauma into resistance, no? In, in thinking about sort of the post-conflict moment, how do women uh, in, 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 in their activism use the trauma of the past to actually not only ask for reparations, but to look at the future and what they might want for the future, because there is this link between contemporary so-called peacetime violence and uh, their memories of political violence, as you so clearly outline as well. And that there, there isn't really necessarily a very clear transition from uh, conflict to peace for uh, uh, many women and, and how they live and, and the context in which they live. So I think that it's really important to think through these, uh, what allows women to turn that fear into resistance. And you do that really well and, and, and really systematically. Rather than going into that framework, which, uh, which you, know, you do really well, um, I just have a couple of sort of comments and questions that uh, draw from my own uh, knowledge and work to sort of think through some of these themes that you um, uh, that you touch upon. One of the things, uh, you know, women resisting violence is, I think, in the Latin American context, increasingly a topic that we can uh, touch upon and highlight because uh, and learn from, particularly because of the failure of the state and the international system to address the systemic and persistent violence against women in peacetime and in conflict time, no? So despite all the um, uh, policy frameworks and activism at high levels around conflict related sexual violence, it's going on and on and on and it doesn't have a, a preventative effect at all as we now see in the context of the war in Ukraine, for example. Um, uh, but also in the context of continuous feminis feminicides in, uh, throughout Latin America. So looking at how and why and in what context women organize, mobilize to resist such everyday violence, both in the context of, of political conflict and uh, domestic or criminal conflict or neighborhood conflict, everyday conflict that women uh, uh, live through is really important. Um, so one of the things that sort of thinking through this sort of women resisting violence and one of the things that I feel is very present in your case studies as well is that a, a lot of women's resistance tends to start with um, organizing around basic needs or at least the organizing around basic, basic needs is one of the motivations that women um, start collective action, no, around water and electricity, around um, neighborhood organizing, around housing, around um, food for children, no. And this is something that, of course, has a long history in Latin America in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, women throughout Latin America organized um, against um, a continuing economic crisis. Um, the, the famous soup kitchens, uh, neighborhoods, uh, housing projects, uh, and indeed lobbying the state for uh, food distributions or for, for, for rights, what Maxime Molyneux would call practical rights, that then very clearly turned into more strategic rights claims uh, that you also discuss so clearly. So to a certain extent, many of these uh, uh, predecessors of your high-risk feminism, these so the soup kitchen, comedores populares, clubes de madres, clubes de damas, the, uh, depending on where you look in Peru, it was those three mainly, they might have had slightly different names in the Colombian context, but I'm sure that they also exist, particularly in urban areas, and they existed elsewhere in Chile and Argentina and, and in Ecuador as well, of course. So I guess that um, 
I, I guess one of my questions would be, how does your framework or how do, do these predecessors perhaps fit in the framework of high-risk feminism uh, and vice versa, no? How, how does high-risk fem feminism perhaps apply to these previous movements? So, you know, taking into account that many of these organizations and mobilizations that mobilized around practical needs, if you wish, were in the end very much concerned with women's rights and violence against women, particularly in the 1990s. So these organizations evolved from something that was really concerned with basic needs into something that was much more um, concerned with women's rights. And that was also out of necessity, you know, this, the necessity to protect each other against husbands that didn't allow women to come together in, in neighborhood uh, community uh, spaces and so on. You know? So wh where and how do you, do, do you see th this connection between one and the other with the predecessors, as I will call it uh, for now? No? Now, obviously one big difference between the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and, 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 and the context in which you study these particular mobilizations is political violence. You know? But we saw the same in the Peruvian context as well, where in the 1980s and 1990s, when Shining Path started its popular war against the state, how these soup kitchens and the Clubes de Dames and, and Clubes de Madres turned into something much more political than that they were intended to when they started in the late 1970s, when they were really directed at feeding the populations and taking care of children. No, so very, very, very quickly, but not very explicitly, these grassroots organizations did, did become beacons of resistance uh, to political violence and for peace and women's rights. Um, so, but perhaps considering the context that you described and the, the specific feminist organizing that you describe in this high risk context of violence, I also started wondering, and this connected to the broader sort of the, the, the emergence of more attention for women's resistance to violence and women's organizing throughout the world, but particularly in Latin America. What, not what is the tipping, as you ask, what is the tipping point? What, what allows women to organize against violence? But actually, what would the tipping point be for women to take up arms to defend themselves? Isn't there, this is a completely hypothetical question, uh, but at the same time, I, you know, the, the levels of violence against women are so high that I do sometimes wonder at what point the resistance becomes also more violent and why doesn't it? And that then relates to the question of how you see the relationship between organizations that you have studied and the framework that you have drawn up around high risk feminism, how you see that related to female combatants, for example, no? which is another perhaps unexpected element that has sort of transgressed gendered stereotypes and gendered social norms, um, or in relation to what others have called insurgent feminism, no? So can you perhaps say a little bit more about how you, where you see your grassroots organizing and high-risk feminism in relation to these more violent forms uh, of uh, women's organization um, and, and where you situate the, 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 these different forms of resistance and mobilization, perhaps. Now, as a last no, point, I'm I wanted to draw on um, on a point that you make so well in your book about uh, where, where you discuss your methodology. And this is really important for all of us who uh, come from uh, uh, wealthy countries and do field work in less wealthy countries. Um, and so you write uh, about your own positionality and how that might have shaped your research. Uh, really important for all of us, of course. And you write about how sometimes the influences of 
external well-meaning people and organizations are, are seen sometimes as problematic, as potentially colonial, and obviously as are always unequal. And you have clearly taken that into account in your work by doing participative, immersive research while constantly reflecting on the potential dangers of being that outsider, no? And you do that really very ethically um, and very well, taking into account what you can and cannot ask, making sure that you don't re-traumatize re and, uh, and, and, and that, you, that, that you take a place, you, you sort of carve out your own place in your own space within the possibilities uh, of, of of that unequal relationships that is simply inevitable. But at the same time, the organizing, and in particular in the leadership that you discuss, some of the, the, the words that the women use, that particularly these, these, these leaders use, you, you see that there is also constructive, a fruitful, cross-fertilization that seemed to be triggered through participation in networks that beyond the local and the regional, no? So there's a learning across borders going on, which is not a colonial learning, but it is, is cross-borders. And you see that despite this, the contextual constraints and, 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 and the inequality of many of these relations, that women and particularly women leaders do adopt the idioms that allow them to not only articulate their concerns and demands, but that they can articulate those concerns and demands in a manner that allows them to speak to multiple audiences. No, they, it allows them to talk uh, to, to local, to their peers, to their male peers, to uh, 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 authorities uh, at a national and a local level, but also at an international level. And one of the, I mean, so I'm talking about terminologies, for example, the term racialized, racializada, doesn't mean, you know, the, the experience of racism is obviously not new, or, uh, but the terminology that is used to indicate what that means does have a certain resonance that is not necessarily local, but that is this, this that, that seems to me to be the product of this learning across borders. And, and I wonder if that is something that you have, uh, that you have picked up on, that you have looked at uh, in more detail. And if, if there is also cross-border learning in relation to, to women's rights, uh, the SEDO, the, if, if you feel that these women's organizations can actually appropriate some of these international um, protocols and, and agreements in order to make claims on the state and uh, the world around them. Um, and I actually am related to that, and, and this is more something that, that um, uh, something that you just said and perhaps even one of the, the images that you showed in the powerpoint um i was wondering to what extent you feel that women are n n are bargaining with patriarchy to make it you know so do, do they they need to negotiate the resistance to male violence but also the protection of male vi no the protection from violence by men you know which is a bargaining with patriarchy, which must be inevitable in some of these um, uh, communities. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, I'll leave it at that, Julia. Many thanks for your uh, wonderful book and your wonderful presentation. And I look forward to, to talk a little bit more about your work. Thanks so much, Yoka. I'm gonna try and turn my camera on at the last few minutes and hope the data doesn't run out. Um, Julia, no, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, would you? We have a question from the audience. Uh, Laura has raised her hand. Would you mind if we hear her question and then you can answer everything and give like some like your final your final words? <laughs> sure, I sure. will. Okay, I'll turn off again. Uh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, Laura, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, Julia, for this 
for the extremely impressive um, research that you're doing. And um, I, I wish that my question wouldn't be the first from the audience because it actually centers allies more than the, the women themselves. Um, and um, my question is about solidarity in terms of allyship. And um, in the context of high-risk feminism and in your experience as a researcher, are people who don't belong to this core group of feminist activists and who perhaps do not share their traumatic experiences, how likely are they to express solidarity and what forms does their solidarity and allyship take and what forms can it take? So does the high risk that characterizes this kind of feminist activism also extend to people who solidarize? Who solidarize? Um, so I personally imagine it, it does, perhaps. Um, I would imagine that, it, that there is a kind of correlation, co correlation, say when you do, let's say, like, let's use the concept like maybe lower risk feminism, um, and maybe solidarizing and, ex and expressing allyship also carries a lower risk with it. So, um, so and also who who does solidarize? Say, so, um, Dr. Jakob Besten has touched on um on, on maybe international um responses and echoes to this high risk feminism. Uh, feminism. I'm more interested in the local and regional ones. So perhaps uh, regarding male family members, if there are any children, siblings. Uh, complete strangers, maybe neighbors or um, students, like how is them the echo in, in, in student communities? Um, yeah, maybe you could speak to this a little bit. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. And thank you again, Yoka. Okay, in like three minutes, I'm gonna try and answer all of those questions, which are all in themselves, uh, kind of a project. Um, but maybe I won't do, but someone, someone else should, should take up. Um, and I think that there is a lot of work to draw on. So at the beginning, Yoka, you were asking about kind of why in the Colombian context, these originally practical needs and, and then search for practical rights or practical interests transferred into the strategic place. And, and I think, I mean, I think one, perhaps going back and, and re-looking at history, as you suggested, maybe we could see, and I'm sure that we can identify instances of high-risk feminism that perhaps we wouldn't have called or framed at that point in time. But I do think that there's a lot of learning from these different experiences. Even the other day, I was speaking to a woman, um, she's part of a victim's rights organization in Mexico, and she was telling me how, as a, as a younger woman, she read about the Madres de Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, and she was inspired by them. And so I think that what we see is we do see this kind of cross-fertilization, and this goes parallel with the development of laws and the international frameworks you were, you were referencing as a way to give shape to language and rights. So, for example, in... Argentina at that point in time, or in Chile at that point in time, it wouldn't have made sense to talk uh, legally or to try and frame women's rights claims in terms of the Women, Peace and Security agenda because it didn't exist. And so as I think as these different mechanisms have developed, as these different um, understandings that women suffer conflict differently because of their gender, that women's roles in peace negotiations and in post-conflict reconstruction is vital. We always knew that, but putting the kind of architecture on it and putting that policy, uh, putting those policy frameworks into place. I mean, if we think about Beijing, if we think about CEDAW, if we think about women, peace and security, these all went developing or were developing over time, giving a way, I think, and this is kind of the legal framing element of the strategy that the women in Colombia use, a way to use the language that isn't just describing what's happening, but also saying like, and there are responsibilities and there are implications of these kinds of, um, you know, conventions that you Colombian government have signed on to and using that really strategically to be speaking the same language. Um, but I do think that there's a development. So, you know, the, the Patricia Guerrero, for example, would talk to me about other women and other women's organizations she'd seen. Um, I think that, there is this kind of understanding that that the the organizations don't come out of nothing and that they're looking always to others. And uh, this kind of goes the solidarity piece you were talking about, and, and it's in it's more in 
the article I referenced before about patriarchal backlash, but the organization, the Alianza in Putumayo is very keen that what I, in what I call, they're either strategically visible or strategically invisible. And these are ways they protect themselves. So for them, strategic invisibility is when they're going between different towns, you know, they'll take different buses, they have phone lines, they are like phone trees to check in with each other, they'll change their clothes so that they don't get picked up on or seen by violent armed actors. And that's a way of protecting themselves. But at the other, on the other side, they love to talk to academics and journalists and be on TV and be in newspaper articles. They love this because for this for them is almost doing like a kind of tech and sick ink boomerang effect whereby they know that just appealing to local authorities isn't going to take care of them. Probably appealing to national authorities isn't going to protect them. But when they have international folks talking to them, writing about them, highlighting them, aware and pendiente that they exist and that they're in these contexts and that we as academics or you know, advocates or um, different embassies, different international organizations are talking back to our governments and are talking back to our communities that then boomerangs back to put pressure on the national and local governments that otherwise they maybe wouldn't be able to achieve. So I think that that can actually be really strategic too. Um, in terms of solidarity, um, Laura, if you're interested, there's a, a book actually about Putumayo and it's about the human rights um, defenders in Colombia. It's not, it doesn't have a gendered focus, but it really digs into that question of international solidarity and what it looks like at the high of the armed conflict. That's by Winifred Tate. She's an anthropologist out of Colby College and I really recommend it. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and she really digs into what that solidarity can look like. And I do think that here in Colombia, or yeah, I'm, I'm in Colombia today, I just tried. Um, here in Colombia, there is this very developed kind of more formalized, more institutionalized feminist network at the national level. And in cities like Bogota and Medellin, over the years very much have been engaging and following trajectories that we've seen through other parts of Latin America. Um, kind of even some of the what Sonia Alvarez might call the NGOization of the feminist uh, organizations, whether or not that's you know, necessarily a positive is up for debate. But we see that developing in parallel and organizations like La Ruta Pacifica, Sisa Mujer, um, here in the different networks at the national level do reach out to these more rural, isolated grassroots organizations as well, and have been working really closely to give them technical support, to put them in conversation with others, um, other power, pe people who are making um, you know, decisions, people, decision makers and, and power holders at the national level. Women did go and women were able to go through lobbying to Cuba, which is where the peace accords were negotiated. And so I think that's really interesting. But to go back to what you were saying, yes, yeah, I definitely do think that over the years and seeing other experiences and being in communication with national level women's organizations and also women's organizations in other countries. And you know, our phones and our abilities to be on social media and to chat with each other and to learn um, from the internet is another real accelerator or catalyst of taking that language, finding new words that perhaps they have been using in a different way to describe what they know is happening in their lives. But, oh, if I call this Racializada, or if I say, you know, this is my right as a victim, which is a very political term in Colombia, or, you know, I have um, rights to, you know, whatever, that using that language gets them the, the ears and the audience, and it's more difficult for those who are in positions of power to negate or deny them because they're then challenging the laws and saying what, what exists in these laws and in these legal frameworks on paper has to exist in practice. And that gives a real kind of leave or, or leverage um, or bargaining tool. And, and I think women are very, the women I work with are very strategic about doing that. And then your final question, um, which is very funny because I was thinking about this yesterday. I was at a, a cafe speaking to a woman um, who, who currently is, is living in a different town because she can't live at home because she's under such, um, such threats of violence for her, her leadership in the community. And she was saying, you know, no, like the, the um, here in Colombia, the National Protection Unit, which ascri or gives bodyguards and um, trucks and protection and there are different levels to social leaders who can demonstrate that they're at risk. She was saying, it doesn't work, it's horrible, I don't like it. Like, it doesn't represent me. It's this very patriarchal way of thinking about protection. It doesn't factor in my actual risk. 
And then when we left, she got into the into the car with a bodyguard from the UN from the National Protection Unit. And I thought like, okay, well clearly, you know, there is some bargaining there. Yeah. I know that she's going to speak to me and say, this isn't good. This isn't what I want. This isn't how it works. Um, I this and she has a very clear list of what protection and what security in the context specific, changing, shifting. Uh, and very gendered context in which she lives, she knows what that looks like. And she's like rallying and lobbying for that. But at the same time, she is taking what little protection does exist and, and kind of making do. So I think that you can hold both things in, in your hand. You can say, this system doesn't work for me. This system is machista. This system is frustrating and doesn't re reflect my realities. But on the other side, I can challenge that as much as I want. I can lobby for it. And I can also agree and see that the, the local realities do require that I engage with it. Um, and I think that that's a, a bigger question in feminism and in the feminist world more broadly. Do we negotiate with patriarchy or do we just blow the whole thing up and, and say, we're gonna start again and it would look better this way. And I would suggest that most of what the, the women I'm working with um, are, are doing both things at the same time. They're being critical, they are making their demands heard, but they're also engaging with what exists. Um, on a kind of functional day-to-day -day level. Um, I hope that that condenses your questions into one somewhat cohesive answer, but I have so many more thoughts and, and yes, I hope we can connect at the conferences that are coming up in the next year or two as, as they're real and, and same with you, Amanda, and everyone here. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for bearing with me with this horrible internet connection. Um, and, and, and thank you so much for the invitation to share my work. I really appreciate and not only kind of having written the book, but also being able to tell these stories, which I feel very privileged to, to have, you know, witnessed and, and shared and, and learned from the women I work with. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, Yauke, and everyone who participated. We did have another question in the chat, Julia, but I see that you're, you're sharing your email and your contact information, so maybe people can contact you for further questions. Uh, thank you for all who participated and for bearing with us with all the, the technical difficulties. We also we're going to have another uh, Global Voices seminar series next week. Uh, we're going to be talking about COVID-19 uh, health workers and who care for the carers. Uh, so make sure to follow the link that uh, we sent earlier earlier in the chat to register for other series. And thank you so much for all of your your presence and thank you once again Julia and Yauke for wonderful comments and stories. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Lovely to see you. Till next time. You too. I hope to see you soon, Yauke. Bye. Till next Bye. time. Bye. Goodbye Bye. everyone. <laughs>